Thomas Marr quickly joined the Young Irelanders as a speaker and an orator and gathered a lot of attention. But in the same year, 1846, he gave a speech at the Conciliation Hall called the Swords Speech, something which is still widely celebrated. And he said that the calls for peace and political reform were not being listened to. So like the Americans and the French, they needed to actually rise up and take what was rightfully theirs. Basically, it was an equivalent to the Holodomor. The crops of the landowners were doing just fine, and they were being escorted out under armed guard, and the people who had to farm on their old property as tenants were forced to eat the potatoes, but those were now blighted. And when you saw soldiers basically guarding the farmer's crops, that the farmer obviously didn't own the farmland justly, they were dying by the droves, and people who actually visited the rural countryside of Ireland at the time remarked that they saw dead bodies in the streets with grass coming out of their mouth because as they starved to death, they would vomit up the grass which they tried to eat just to get the, the bare nutrients that they needed. And when he gave this speech at Conciliation Hall, it caused a rift in the Young Irelanders movement, and they abandoned Thomas Marr, and he formed the Irish Confederation and began fighting a battle which, which was part of the Wars of 1848 at the time. It was a continent-wide uprising against monarchies. He began to fight in this. And he was captured, and he was sentenced with drawing and quartering, which to me is crazy that that would happen in 1848. However, because Thomas Marr was the son of a wealthy family, because his father was a wealthy merchant, and because he was a well-known orator, they gave him a pass of leave. Basically something which said, we're going to send you to the prison colony in Van Diemen's Land, which is now Tasmania, so long as you promise to never try to escape, so long as you stay there. Marr quickly discovered that three quarters of the people were there because they had simply stolen food, basically petty theft. And he met a woman named Catherine Bennett and fell in love. And this is where Thomas Marr's grand escape actually happened. After he had sent his wife over to Ireland, he wrote camp authorities saying, I understand that I had a civil agreement to not leave this island, that because you reprieved my execution, it was done in exchange for me on my honor saying I'm not going to escape. However, I am giving you formal notice of my intent to escape. And after he sent this letter off, he got into a small boat with the intention of sailing to New Zealand. So it it was pure luck that a vessel that was American, also a merchant mariner, passed by him and picked him up. And he swam up to the vessel and discovered to his pleasant surprise that the captain was a man who absolutely hated the British because a lot of tension was still happening between America and England at the time. And he decided to take Marr and bring him back to New York where Marr's legend really begins in America. As soon as he got his U.S. citizenship, he commissioned as a captain in the 69th. This would later become one of the most renowned fighting units in the Civil War. The first commander of this brigade gained quite the reputation because the Prince of Wales came over in the years preceding the Civil War and decided to go on a little bit of a tour. And he wanted to have a military expo, kind of a demonstration for him to show the prowess of the Union Army. But this man who was commanding the 69th said absolutely not and he refused to bring his troops out a song which is now celebrated in a lot of Irish folk music about the Civil War in America now when the Prince of Wales came over here and made a hubbub oh 
Everybody turned out, you know, in golden tinsel too. But then the good old 69th didn't like these lords or peers. They wouldn't give a damn for kings, the Irish volunteers. We love the land of liberty, its laws we will revere. But the devil take a nobility, says the Irish volunteers. And because of this, the regiment became known, almost a little bit notorious for the event. And after this, he was threatened with court-martial. But the commander of the unit, which uh, Marr was actually underneath, the commander was retained because the Civil War began, and they needed as many high-ranking officers as they could possibly get. Thomas Marr was the second in command at the First Battle of Bull Run. However, the Confederate Army actually managed to capture the primary commander, and Thomas Marr took up the reins as the commander of the 69th. Now, throughout the war, they gained a very unusual reputation. People didn't like them because there was still discrimination amongst the Irish in America at the time. But because of this, they wanted to prove themselves. They started out with 1,200 soldiers, and by the end of the war, they only had a couple hundred men. And it's very interesting how Thomas Marr came into the position as a commander of the Union Army, because he went to the South before the war. He was giving lectures on his escape from Van Diemen's Land and on Irish nationalism, and he really did like Southern culture. And initially, he supported of the Confederacy. However, he recognized the need for a United States, a union, to assist the Irish cause of independence, something which he believed he was fighting for. After the Civil War was over, Thomas Marr used some of his political connections to gain an appointment to a post in Montana. The president appointed Marr to the post of the Secretary of the Territory of Montana, and he began his cross-country trip basically thinking that he would arrive here and go to the governor's mansion and he would work there inside of the governor's mansion. But he quickly discovered that the capital of the territory of Montana was a small gold mining community called Virginia City. And it was populated by vigilantes, criminals, gunfighters, and the governor who saw him when he came into town literally said, you can be governor now, and he left. So Thomas Marr now found himself in the post of a governor in the town of Virginia City. And at the time, because just a few years ago there was no formal law up until 1864 when uh, the territorial judges arrived, there were a group called the Vigilantes, which was essentially just the Ku Klux Klan in a different form. Naturally, they hated Irish, they hated immigrants, they hated Catholics, and they used their frontier justice logic to justify a lot of lynchings of innocent people. And when Thomas Marr reviewed the case of one of the people who was tried for shooting somebody in a bar, he found that the man was most likely innocent, and he gave him a reprieve. But he made the enemy of the vigilantes, who literally the following day strung up this man who was just reprieved by the governor from a tree, leaving a note on his chest saying, we are the vigilantes. And essentially, if the governor does this again, if he usurps our decision, to hang this man, then he will be the next up on the tree. And here is where the mystery really begins. I will kind of give a brief description of the mystery itself, of the disappearance of Thomas Marr, and then go into some of my theories. Basically, he tried to lead the militia of Montana against the Blackfoot tribe. And to do this, he received a shipment of guns from General Sherman, who was still with the Union Army. And in order to do this, he traveled from Virginia City up towards uh, Fort Benton. And at Fort Benton, he fell off of the side of the steamship that he was on. Now, of course, because he had made so many enemies throughout the territory, and because he was a Republican, a lot of Southern Democrats were throughout the territory, a lot of Protestants, and a lot of people who naturally hated this man, Thomas Marr. So they started spreading the rumor that he simply got drunk and fell off the side of the steamboat, basically saying, oh, he's a drunk Irishman. Now, the steamboat 
was actually anchored to Fort Benton, and the wife quickly discovered that her husband was nowhere to be found, that he had went missing from the upper deck of the steamboat, so she demanded the boat sail up and down, and this was in the middle of the year, it wasn't freezing, he shouldn't have died, and no trace of his body was ever found. He vanished off the face of the earth. Now, a lot of people still maintain that he just fell off and drowned, and that his body was washed down the river, because about 30 years later, a huckster found a body of a prospector that had washed down the river and it had a bullet hole in the forehead. So they dressed this body up in a Union General uniform and toured him around the country demanding 25 cents to see him from anybody who saw him before he said that he sent the body to the Smithsonian, but the Smithsonian has no record of ever receiving it, so it's very likely that this was just the body of somebody dug up from a nearby Boot Hill Cemetery who was executed by the vigilantes in years past. And and the body of Mar has never been found, but the theory I have revolves around a small monastery about a hundred miles to the west of here.